Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited for this program. Um, I'm it's just excited to, to hear all that um, our, our colleagues have to share. My name is Deb Clemens. I'm the Assistant Director of Public and Academic Programs at the RISD Museum. And I will welcome you before handing it off to my colleague, Wai Yi Chung. I'm gonna start by um, sharing with you an evolving um, land acknowledgement that museum colleagues have been working on. Uh, it's a way to acknowledge uh, the land that the museum occupies. And as we share it, you can think about the land that you're currently occupying. The RISD Museum is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the ancestral territory of the Narragansett people. Many indigenous communities have moved through this area over hundreds of generations and indigenous people from many nations near and far continue to live, study and work in Providence today. We as museum staff are committed to actively addressing in our daily work, our shortcomings as their neighbors and the many violent legacies of colonialism. An acknowledgement of native voices and histories is crucial to this work as we move forward to rectify the destructive past. And now I'll send it off to Yi to introduce our speakers and talk to you about the format of the program today. Enjoy, thank you. Thank you, Deb. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar names and faces in our audience. Um, unfortunately, I think I can only see four or five people at a time, but I did scroll through and, and notice that um, many good friends and family are in the audience. So thank you for joining us this afternoon as we explore this new exhibition, Text, Paratext and Images. Uh, I'd like to thank Kwan Hong Liu and Kimia Ratnavardi for joining us today and to Deb Clemens for making this happen. Let me start by introducing um, our co-curators for the exhibition. Kwan Hong Liu is a PhD student in the History of Art and Architecture Department at Brown University. He received his BA and MA at the National Taiwan University, majoring in medieval Chinese art and focusing on calligraphy and cultural activities of the Mi family in the Southern Song Dynasty. Kwan Hong worked at the National Palace Museum in Taipei, doing research in scientific analysis of artifacts. And now he studies the relationship between art and printing, as well as the construction of paragons in art. Kimia Ratnavardi is a designer at Jill Neubauer Architects in Falmouth, Massachusetts. During her time at RISD, Kimia was a graduate assistant in the Asian Art Department and the Henry Luce Foundation Curatorial Fellow in the Decorative Arts and Design Department at the RISD Museum. She graduated from Manhattanville College in 2018 with a BA in Studio Art and graduated at RISD with a Master of Design in 2020 in Interior Architecture. So, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to this exhibition, Text, Paratext, and Images. The exhibition is located um, in the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Print Gallery on the sixth floor of the, muse of the museum. For those of you who don't know our museum very well, um, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a gallery that is part of the Asian galleries on the sixth floor. Originally commissioned by Lucy Aldrich, Abby Rockefeller's sister and Abby's sons, David and Nelson Rockefeller, to display Abby's Japanese print collection, the gallery has since evolved to host diverse exhibitions that include more than just Japanese prints, as you will see. As the curator overseeing this gallery, it is my hope and intention to open up this space to include more voices in the future. So when the opportunity arose last spring and there was an opening in the exhibition schedule. I invited Kwan Hong and Kimia to co-curate an exhibition together when they were both working with me in the Asian art department. I suggested the theme of text and image based on both of their research interests and encouraged them ex to explore works from all regions in Asia. As a result, you will see a truly dynamic cross-cultural and intertemporal exploration of the relationships between text and image in this show. 
Quan Hong and Kim Ye have worked together to compare, contrast, and pair works from all over Asia as they investigate different artistic practices and collaborations, as well as different forms of artistic engagement. I really regret that we cannot all be in the gallery together today, but I hope that through these images that you see here, we can at least imagine that we are in the space together as a group. So from this angle, we see, if you can follow my cursor here, the introductory panel for the exhibition, and right next to it, a beautiful Turkish Quran page. Moving our eyes to the right, we will see um, a display that is centered on a dynamic print by Hakumaki over here, a contemporary Japanese artist. And then on either side of that, Persian and Japanese works that highlight the ornamental aspects of text. Now from the opposite corner of the gallery, we see other relationships of text and image, how they symbolize social class and cultural norms in different regions. And finally here in the center of the gallery, a case that displays a palm leaf manuscript and leaves from an Indian Jain Kalpa Sutra manuscript that highlight the importance of materials and in determining in determining the artistic process. Now, without further ado, I'd like to begin with some questions for Kimya and Kwan Hong. Um, I will be asking them questions um, along uh, throughout this, this program, and I will also leave um, some time at the end for questions um, from the audience. So please um, note down your questions you know, for all of us. So let's start by um, asking, you know, I'd like to ask Kwan Hong and Kimia to tell us the audience a little bit about the exhibition and what narrative or message that they wanted to convey to their audience. Um, so for this exhibition, as why you put it together very well, um, the main focus was really on text because like when it comes to text as a general, we don't really look at text as a form of art per se, but it's usually text that it's like, um, that it's written to talk about a piece of art, to kind of represent a piece of art and not itself being an art. So that was the reason we wanted to kind of like look at it differently and see how in different cultures and countries, they actually use text as a form of art on its own and to kind of find similarities between two cultures. It was a mixture of cultures, but like the Persian and Japanese as the main, that like how these two cultures that are so different from one another, even their alphabet is completely different, but still we were able to find some similarities on, on how they use the text in the same format to sometimes represent their religious, sometimes secular art, to kind of like compare them together. And that was the reason when we were putting the show together, actually, we kind of tried instead of having like a wall is specific for Japanese and another for Persian, we actually looked to find those similarities and put them right next to one another. So by the time that like, unfortunately right now we cannot really walk through the gallery, but like by the time if eventually we will be able to walk through the gallery, we will be able to see that no matter what is their alphabet or culture, you can find those similarities. And especially like um, when it comes at least for the Islamic art, um, for many, many centuries and years, the beliefs was that, especially at the beginning of Islam, that they no artist should really use figure drawing of any sort, even still life, because like the belief was that God is the only one that is really has the skills to create beautiful faces and creatures or whatnot. And because of that, it was really looked down upon the artist if they tried to draw faces because like it was simply they looked at it as that like people are there the artist is challenging the power of god and so for the muslim countries and the uh, muslim artists they try to look for a different way to still be able to create their own type of art without really challenging their religious of the time and so that was the reason they kind of turn into using text 
calligraphy and pattern design. And that's what you see on many of their uh, Islamic artwork, even like their architecture. And uh, one of the reasons that these two uh, painting that we're seeing right now, it was like, so lovely. And we picked it actually for the like, uh, for the starting of the show. It's because both of these uh, paintings are of two famous poets and it kind of represent the role that poets and poetry had in these two cultures and how um, they weren't only appreciating the art that they had with the poetry but also themselves and like a lot of different artists try to showcase them even years after they've been uh, dead and uh, this was like one of the like the very early on easy similarities that we were able to see that like we can find a lot of different uh, drawings of different poets. And uh, for the next image that we have, um, this one, it's actually a Persian artwork of the story of Joseph. And uh, for those who know, Joseph is a holy figure and like he has been mentioned in different religious, what had happened in his story. And so um, it's very tiny, but if you will be able to like really look at the piece, you will see that any time that Joseph is in the drawing, there's a halo around his face. And that's a very common thing, even in a lot of Western paintings, that to represent a holy person, they would have that halo. And also when you look at the figures, one of the reason that they were never really drawn realistically as much as they should. It wasn't because like the artist wasn't skillful or anything, they were, but they kind of wanted to stay humble and not try to like draw those like super realistic figures, but they did it very simply, but it's still they were able to use their um, text in the drawings on parts um, to tell this story and still represent it. And also like the, another beauty of it was that like for English, for example, for the text, we are used that we go from left to right, but in Persian, we actually do it from right to left. And then there's like some Japanese word that actually go from up to down. And like, even like for some Persians, there are like some piece of the text that it's on one corner and then it moves to another. So we really try to like look at all of these different ways that they were using the text to kind of represent and showcase their skills and their art. Thank you, um, Kimi, for that wonderful description and, and for highlighting some of the objects that you really enjoy um, from the exhibition. Um, so in this exhibition, there are so many examples of how text um, inspires images and vice versa, as well as examples of how text um, becomes an artistic experience. Can you talk a little bit more about these different relationships within the context of the culture that they were created in? Uh, I can speak, a, first I can speak a little about how we came out with a title, text, paratext and images. So because we are working with Asian objects and we assume that most of the people cannot read all the language that are presented in the exhibition. So we try to move from the text, the meaning of a text itself to the way, the way and the way how we look at this or read this test. So although we do it like this, it's, a, it's like a everyday practice, but there are many factors that influence how we read or read the test or view the image. So like the material and the, how it is presented and the cultural sphere we're in. So, uh, so um, I, we want to bring attention to like how the relationship between the test image, image and paratest. So the picture on the left is an example of a Japanese Uba printing. And this is a special kind of printing called Joluli. So if we look at a figure first, we can see the female is wearing a very fancy dress and possibly a courtesan and maybe a high ranked courtesan. So, but if we only look at a figure, we cannot know that the specific person this figure represented. But we, if we look at a test behind, 
this the test behind is called Jaluli, and this kind of test is a script of the play. So if the viewer can read the title of the test, then he will know this figure is a character from the story. And, and this story is, a, is about a courtesan trying to run away from the Yukaku, like the red light district. So, and if we know, know this fact, we look, at, look back on the figure. There are some purple and light blue bars on her clothes. And there are many birds between the bars. So this is a kind of iconography that imply the courtesans are like a bird trapped in the yukaku. The, the, she is trapped in the red light district and she wants to be free from it. So, so this is the way how the test can incite the designer to create a different image. And on the other hand, the, uh, the test on the background, mm, this is obviously not the, to not the total content of the story. So this is, this test is not for, read, for the viewers to read all of the stories, but we can see the figure is arranged on the book on the screen. So we can also know that the figure is from this story. And, and the, the jewelry on the back also, if we assume this is, this is a advertising for advertisement for a play, then this test can also be a, like, to invoke the reader's interest because this is not the whole story and the viewer or the reader can know this is a story about the courtesan and maybe she wants to run away from the yukaku. So I think this is how the designer work with the text and image at the same time. This is great, Guan Hong. So in other words, what you're saying is that this is almost like um, a trailer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one can have a little bit of a glimpse of what the story is to be. And the artist has so creatively incorporated aspects of the story um, metaphorically into the robes that one, you know, it's almost like um, one can um, have a little bit of a um, preview of what the play is going to be before one watches it, right? Mm -hmm. So th that's, a, that's a great example of, of, of many layered meanings. What's about the, um, the work on the right? Oh. So <laughs> this is, hmm. so in, we choose this object because this is a very, maybe a traditional aesthetic, object that we think it can like regard it as a higher art. So in East Asia, there is a tradition that the brush, the brush strokes and the brush is a very important factor when we, when we try to uh, uh, like appraise this art. So um, traditionally, at least in East Asia, painting and calligraphy are all done by brushes. And, and in evaluating the art, art objects like calligraphy or painting, it's common for the literati to say that the to say about the quality of the brush strokes. And the brush stroke is very is related to the calligrapher or painter's moral and personalities and emotions. So, th so this is, so how the brush shows are presented is very important in East Asia. And this is a example of how, how the brush stroke is important because this is a printed rubbing. So at first, uh, there is a very long process for for making a calligraphy to be a uh, rubbings. 
So first, the calligrapher need to write on a stone or wood block. If not, a uh, artisan will copy the calligrapher's writing on the stone or wood blocks. Then the cover will carve out the stone or wood. Then another rubber will make a another rubber. A person will make a rubbing from the stone or wood. So, but we can know that because brush is very soft and the stone or wood is not a proper material to replicate the brush, but they still do it. And and in this case, this is a printed rubbing. So, so the producer of this art is try to imitate a rubbing by making a print. So uh, although it went through a long process and all the material is not suitable for replicating the brush stroke, they still try to remain the brush stroke. So we can see like the, uh, how the calligrapher use his tip of the brush or use, the style, use his style of brush to represent his scale and where he pauses. So I think it's a uh, object that can show the importance of the brush strokes in East Asia. But it's also fascinating that it shows the virtuosity of the carver as well, that he's able to um, replicate mm -hmm. um, the, the undulations and, and the rhythm of the brush, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for that explanation. Kimia, would you like to add anything before I move on to the next question? Um, well, if we can actually talk about the image that is after this, it's kind of like similar to this one. Um, so for this piece, as you can see, it is an ornamental page of, um, it could be a cover or it could be a page between the cover. And so for this one, it was very hard, especially at the beginning. When you look at it, you cannot really see the text. It is very small and it's very skillfully kind of hidden in between the middle part. So like I really needed to like go in there. And since like the writing for these, again, as we mentioned, that like it's on its own form of art, it is not that like they really simply just wrote down the name or the title or whatnot. They really try to kind of put it inside the design. And so because of that, I even like, like um, Farsi, the language is my main, my first mother language. And so like, I can read and write it, but like still, like when I was looking at this, I was like, oh my God, I don't know what is this. I like really take a while for me to like really be able to like find out the little, little letters and words and put them together to figure out what is saying. And so um, this is similar that like, um, it is kind of different in a sense of the Japanese work that we were just looking at that that one, you kind of can see a lot of the letters and the writing at the back of the woman, but at the same time, the same as her, her skirt, that you do not first notice that there are some words and letters there. And this is similar to that, that like you first do not really recognize that there is anything, and especially if you do not even speak the language or have seen at least the alphabet of it, you cannot really say that there is anything but just the pattern and the design. But then when you look at it through, you actually notice that how carefully they have actually put them together, have uh, designed the pattern so it can kind of like cuddle up the words in between it and have it in the middle. And then um, this piece, it's one of those that I so wish that we could have been in the exhibition because this piece, it's very small. It's one of my favorites, but it's very tiny. It's like maybe like this big, it's very tiny. And so because of that, I actually really love it because like the skills and the talent and went through this for the person to be able to actually cut the words out because like they actually had it, the, like it had the, the gold, page and then they had the like the uh, the blue navy ish paint on top of it and then they carved out the words and the design on the corners and on the side and so because of that it is so beautiful that like how they actually I feel like they had a magnifying glass in front of them one of those very huge one because the piece is so tiny to be able to like really cut it out 
And um, another beauty of it is that like, as you can see, it is not really written in the straight lines. And um, that's another thing that a lot of the Islamic and Persian works they actually use. They try to like made their, um, their writing work with their design with the page and sometimes what they wanted to write down it would actually really fit if they would have written it up to down they wrote it in a like a not a kind of an angular line and so that's a reason that like for a lot of them you see they're written in different parts and different ways and it's um this one is actually very like consistent and you can kind of tell where it starts and when it ends but like some of the other pieces when I was actually reading them I was like oh it's going from right to left but then like I read it and I was like this is making no sense and then I look and I was like oh no it's actually going up and down so they really played even with the layout of how to put these texts on these pieces and so um it's just for me was just wonderful to like try to figure them out it was like a little game and then I would be like is there any other words and I would try to like look at the corners and see if there's any other text or letters uh, kind of hidden inside of the design that they had so it's 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 fun it's like a game thank you and and I you know just to reiterate what Kimia said about the scale and the size of these works um, I just want to bring us back um, to the gallery for just um, a tiny moment for you to see just how small um, these works are so the the item that she just talked about if you look at it is just this piece here right next to the the central piece by Hakumaki and these were the two ornament pages that she was just talking about so you can see just like how tiny and how miniaturized these works are thank you for um the wonderful descriptions Kwan Hong and Kimia so I guess my next question um for you has to do with materials and mediums. How do you think the, the materials impact the process of text and image creation? And how did the artists work with these materials? Would you care to elaborate a little bit about this? Perhaps um, changing to the next slide, we, we can talk a little bit about this. These are two palm leaves and I choose this algebra because they are, they can, show us how the material can impact the writings. So the upper picture is a Thai manuscript. And so it's made of palm leaves. And because the palm leaf is very thin and long, just like the shape in the picture. And, and it's because it's plant. So the, the fiber is breakable. And in this case, it is partly written, partly written in Khmer. So, so the Khmer is a kind of language and script that the strokes are very rounded because they need to write on the palm leaves. So if, if they use like rectangular stroke, it's easy to break the fiber in the palm leaves. So they, they use a uh, iron iron stylus to carve on the palm leaves, and after they carve it, they use some oil to um, to brush on it, so make the characters more obvious. So the so the material kind of restrict how they write on the palm leaves. And another example is uh is a palm leaf, but it's it's written on paper. So it's Sanskrit written on paper. And mm, Sanskrit is a language that will have many, maybe not rectangular sword, but at least they will have a very long horizontal line on the top. So you can imagine if we write it or carve it on a palm leaf, the fiber is going to break and it's not stable. But on the other hand, uh, the Sanskrit palm leaf still remains the format of a palm leaf, like remaining a both side blank. And usually there are some notes or color forms written on the side. And in the middle, there is a 
square and this square is used for binding like the bindings on the Thai pound list but they they remain but they didn't bind it so although although the material does not restrict the writing anymore but the pound list still remain the traditional format and possibly because their function is related to religion and is uh, it's more likely to preserve the original format because they are believed to be sacred. And if we recall the if we recall the robins we just saw, then these two are very different objects because um in the robins we can see they try to use the material that are not suitable for replicating but on this object we see they the they use a material more suitable of writing but so i think this these two objects can show how the material influence the text and image but they use different approach so one choose to preserve the artistic artistic aspect of the first job and but and this one try to preserve the format and these two are not related object but if we think we see really from a material aspect they I, we can compare these two objects together thank you Quan Hong so in other words do you think that um, the development of the script and like the evolution of the aesthetics of the script you know um, in other words like do you think that in itself is influenced by the um, material of the palm leaf, right? So even if um, Khmer or um, Pali or the language that they are inscribing, do you think that the roundedness of the script um, was developed because of, you know, the writing medium? Um, I think from what I have read, it is the... <laughs> But I think this is a very rare case because the because the material is very special and they're using because they're not writing and because they they're carving. So it's very so the letter are very influenced by the materials in but if you are only writing then then the palm list might not be that influential if they only write, but if because they choose to carve, then the letter need to be adjusted. I see. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, so now I'd like to move on um, to the actual process of um, um, curating an exhibition and, and installing an exhibition. And I wanted to hear what um, the two of you had to say about the process behind putting the exhibition together. How did you select the works, for instance, and what were some of the considerations you had to make? Um, for many of the pieces, so the way that it started first, especially because like why also had just uh, kind of started to like going through all the like the Asian pieces that were in our department. And so I was so excited to just go through everything. I looked at everything like hundreds of different times to be able to like pick the pieces. And it was very hard because like I am one of like I'm the worst when it comes to like picking something, especially like when I have to like, I have a, like a certain numbers and I could not pick everything that I love. So it was very hard on me to kind of like pick just a certain number of pieces. And then even when we were like looking through them, we were like, is it really going to add anything or is it going to be repetitive? Because like a lot of pieces, even though they're all just gorgeous and beautiful on their own, but um, we had something that could have been a little bit similar to it or whatnot. So we have to kind of like put them to the side. And then there were some pieces that like, um, I really wanted them to like to showcase them and it was like this is the one but then um by the time that I like uh, show them to YE she would be like nope that was just like showcase like last last exhibition or the exhibition before so it's better to like showcase something that it's like 
hasn't uh, been shown for a while. So I would be like, oh my God. So it took a while. And sometimes even like the condition, because like some of these pieces are so old that um, they are very fragile. And if we wanted to showcase them, it would have been really damaged them. So like we needed to also consider that and put some of those works to the side. But it was just like, for me, it was, very interesting and also educating to kind of look through all of these pieces and like kind of see how I can find what I'm really looking for and not just be biased because they look perfect and gorgeous but like because they really do add something to the exhibition and also another thing that was kind of like interesting for me at least it was like by the time that I was picking some of the pieces and then I was looking at the uh, museum's um, um, the documentation of those pieces. It was very interesting for me because for me, I am a lot of these people or the like either the poet, the painter or whatnot, their name, I have heard them all my life in Farsi. And the way that they're pronounced or even sometimes written in English, it's completely different. And sometimes it's not even the same thing. They have given them like a different sort of name. And so like for me, when I was like looking, I was like, why? I don't think this is the right person. And then I would like look and it would be like, sometimes I was right. There was like, actually it was like the piece was something completely different, but they had assumed that this is like related to another piece or painting. So like the information was not really accurate. And sometimes I would be like, oh, this is the way that like they write it down or like they say it in English. So it was very interesting for me to like go through some of these pieces that like I have actually seen or heard or read about them when I was back in Iran and in Farsi and then like look at them in English and like see how they are like different similar. So it was a very interesting uh, kind of way to like go through them and like look and some parts and some pieces I will be like I actually know more about these and that really happened because like when you're in a museum and you look at the like the documentation that they have it's actually very complete they know much more but then like when it came to the Farsi pieces and the Persian ones I was like I actually can read these and like that was one of the reasons that me and why were so excited because like there was finally a person who can read Farsi and like she would like show me pieces and was like so what is this one is saying and I was like oh this is a poem and some of them I didn't even understand I was like I'm not sure what is happening here so I needed to kind of like looking through it so it was very fun for me. Thank you Kimia it was indeed fun to look at everything together. What's about you Quan Hongs what were some of the um, sort of memorable or challenging things that you remember from the process? I think Picking an object is most difficult for me because at the beginning, why you just told me that the exhibition need to be something about test. So I start by looking at the object that I feel I am more familiar with. But besides the condition of the objects, there are also some other limitations. I, I found a Wrapping of an avatar, but that is too large. And also, I found some books uh, like a uh, painting manuals, but it's hard to um, present them in the gallery because they can be hung on the wall. And if they, if we place them in a middle box, we can only open only one page of it. So I think it's not very suitable for me to pick this kind of objects. And another thing is that I assume the intended audience is different because when I was working at the National Palace Museum, I know the, like the collection in a, of the National Palace Museum focus on Chinese art and the visitors will have some basic knowledge of the at least about painting and calligraphy and ceramics. But here I think the the intended audience and the purpose of the museum is a little different. I, the, the purpose of the museum is trying to incite in, evoke conversation different different between different fields and maybe for the RISD students to think about what can be like, what is 
interesting and maybe you can use it as a creative reference, something like that. So, and also we are using Asian objects. I, I think most of the people, most of the audience might not be, might not have very profound knowledge, knowledge about it. And maybe most of the people cannot read the language. So, mm, so picking an object and how to show how to make the audience to feel we can still read this object without knowing a language, I think is also very important to us. Thank you. Thank you both for um, your answers and, and your um, responses and, and comments. Um, Deb, is it a good time now to open it up to the audience for some questions? Because I noticed that um, there's been some activity in the chat, so I don't want to um, and without, you know, having our audience chime in as well. Sure. Why don't we do this? Um, if we do need to go back to the works, we can um, maybe share the screen of course. again. But of otherwise, course. we could all see each other. Um, if you stop sharing the screen, there we go. And I can spotlight. Oh, wow. Now <laughs> I see everyone's window. Yeah. <laughs> um, what a, we, we do have a great, um, a lot of people um, today. So um, would you like to read out the questions or should I do that? Um, let's see, um, there's a question here, uh, Kimia. I found what you shared about your experience of decoding the text very interesting. It made me wonder how the original audience of these objects would interact with these objects and in what context, public, private, religious, if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, um, that's actually a very great question. So um, for a lot of these pieces, especially those that were actually created using um, gold and those expensive type of inks, a lot of them actually did belong to either the like um, the mosque itself or like some of them were for the very um, rich families, the kings of sort, they, a lot of them actually paid artists to create those pieces, especially when it came to like the religious pieces, because like they really wanted to show the importance that they put on religious, especially by the time that first Islam moved to the Persian uh, empire. And by Persian, I mean, not only like Iran, but like all the other countries around like India, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, that all used to belong to the like the old Persia dynasty and country. So um, a lot of them, did belong to really mostly a, like a private group of people and it wasn't really open to the public. But then at the same time, they had a lot of uh, different type of artworks and books that um, they were for the public, that they were like, um, the, like the public could afford them and buy them because like um, Oran especially was like a holy book similar to like Bible that a lot of people do own in their own houses even though maybe some of those were not as glamorous but it's still the artwork that was used in it was actually similar uh, the material was a little bit like cheaper per se but the artwork is was still similar and like the person who had put the time and effort to actually uh, write those pieces and create the design still wanted because like they were well known and because of that they tried to keep the quality of the work the same no matter who was really paying them or what material they were using and then at the same time when it came to the architecture aspect of it when like um, you would walk through a lot of these like beautiful gorgeous mosque and like palaces those were actually the time that the like the public especially the like the open public part of the like the palace or the like the mosque that belonged to the like the public that they would go they were able to actually really interact with them and to see and to kind of like have the name of the like the holy people on the mosque or like the people got designed and so it was something that like um it really depend on the type of the work because like religious again was more open to the public, but then at the private it was like really just belong to the rich and the king, and so um, I I it, it was like um, it is a very interesting experience because like for example Hafez the poet that we actually saw the first image the Persian poet he was actually a very humble man and he 
even though he was very famous, even in his own time, he never really much owned anything. And so like people were interacting with him and he would write the poems for sometimes just for the public, sometimes for the people who he loved and sometimes for God. So like it was something that like even um, for people who were not the wealthy one and couldn't even read, that was another thing that they found it interesting that they can still like look at those design and enjoy it even though they cannot really like read it sometimes, you know? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, There's a couple more questions, Yi. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I see that as well. <laughs> so why from, don't you from, why don't you take them? Yeah. So from from Carrie um, is the question of um, is the UFA calligraphy rubbing Japanese or Chinese, and was ink rubbings popular in Japan? Would you like to answer that, Kwanul? So. so uh, the UFA calligraphy rubbing is a Japanese Uba printing trying to imitate a uh, rubbing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a Japanese printing, and but the language is Chinese. And was in rubbing popular in Japan? I think it depends on which period you are talking with, but generally I will say yes and no. <laughs> so, so, um, so traditionally ink rubbing is always regarded as a second level comparing to the original writing because they cannot fully replicate and it, there are always something lost between the process, but ink rubbing is more likely to be circulated because you only have one original writings, but with the uh, stone and all the wood bar carvings, you can make many ink rubbings and circulate it. So um, it is popular and <laughs> is popular than the original. And sometimes the rubbings are very popular that they develop a special aesthetic of the rubbings. Like because the so because the like the covers they cover stone they cannot replicate the, the round day turnings. So sometimes they are the calligraphy are transformed into a more rectangular style. And in some period, the rectangular style become a more prominent calligraphy style. So it kind of feedback to the calligraphy writing. So, mm, so that's my answer. Thank you. Um, we also have another question from Janaya Kizi. Are you seeing rev um, rev reverberations or similarities of these techniques in recent 21st century artwork? And do you have any favorite examples? Um, I think for um, the like the Persian pieces, well, calligraphy, it's a very, it's a part of my culture and like they're still doing it. And I think it's like a practice that it's like in a lot of different countries that they do have their own type of calligraphy and language, they do that. And um, also when it comes to the, like those pattern design, that's also actually, it's one of those things that still we're practicing it. Um, it's something that like has became a part of the culture. And even though right now it's not similar to at the beginning of the slum that people were like trying to not paint any facing of any face, like right now you see a lot of portraits or whatnot, um, but it's still that pattern design had stayed with us. And we use it in a lot of, um, when it comes to our architecture, to our arts and like, um, even like, it's not really a favorite piece per se, but like by the time that I was doing my 
uh, senior show when I was back in undergrad, my focus actually was on pattern design because we use it not only for architecture, but it's also for textile. If you see a lot of the actual um, Persian clothing, you see that they use a lot of those patterns. So it's something that had kind of still stayed within the culture and they try to use it for closing, for furniture. And so it's something that it's still around. And for me, the favorite ones are actually the ones that are unknown. The ones that like, by the time that like I walk through the market and I see a lot of like women who had done them by hands and they look just gorgeous and fabulous and they're not very well-known artists or anything. They're something that they have been doing for years passed down from family to family. So I really enjoy that it when it's used in tech, uh, textile. It's, I think that's the part that like they really marry the color and pattern together. That sounds fascinating. I, I wish we had some examples of that in, in the collection. What's for you, Kwan Hong? Do you have any thoughts about um, your favorite examples? Mm, I can provide a example of not similarity, but a little like different. So the like writing calligraphy at still is a very, um, like many people still write calligraphy today, but not many people make rubbings today. So the rubbings become, um, I, it's, kind of become more a, like a political thing because it can show you have the power to make something because it needs a lot of labor and so so in the past it's for presenting the choreography but of course it has some political consideration but now it becomes more political because Preservation is is not limited to making a rubbing and carve on stone or wood, but now it becomes like I think the most of places I see a carving or rubbings are at are at some maybe the plaque of the buildings or the gardens. So like the some larger architect architect will have some. Mm, well, have the carving or rubbings to show they have the, this is, have the power to make these things. So, mm, so I think this is the example of remaining a tradition, but used it in a little different ways. So I think we've caught up with the chat. Yi, I wondered if you could just briefly speak about what it's like to uh, share a curatorial voice. I feel like you've been very generous um, with, with sharing this space. And I'm just wondering how this uh, experience has informed your own curatorial practice. Um, I think that, you know, as I said earlier, the, the Japanese ga print gallery is, is a very special and, and unique place because it's, it's a space where um, exhibitions rotate twice a year. So I found that, you know, it creates the perfect opportunity, you know, for us to have different voices or more voices within the museum. So in um, not necessarily, you know, a change in my own curatorial perspective, but I think that what I'd like to see happen in a museum um, is um, the, 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 the ability for us to see more of these voices, you know, and, and diverse voices represented in the museum. So the opportunity to give Kwan Hong and, and Kimia um, this uh, project of, of curating an entire show and, and guiding them through the process, I found that to be extremely enriching and, and rewarding and, and definitely a learning experience for me too. In many ways, all three of us had to work together and learn together. This was the first exhibition that was installed during the pandemic. Um, we did the entire installation virtually um, through Zoom. So that was um, an experience in itself, um, being able to, to navigate 
navigate, you know, uncharted waters, as, as you said. Um, but but also, I think in, in bringing together a show that is interregional, intertemporal, so that I think is is also challenging as well. And and um, in uh, encouraging them to 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 you know look beyond what they're familiar with and and what their comfort level is you know and and explore different things and and Kwan Hong and Kimia have have been such um, great students to work with because they're so curious and they're always up for the challenge and up for looking at things you know differently and, and interpreting things differently and I'm very very proud of um, what they've achieved and and um, the exhibition. So, um, yeah. That's wonderful. I'm wondering if there are any um, final thoughts and questions from, from you both. Um, at last chance for questions in the chat will be ending at one o'clock. If there's no questions, actually, or, you know, while you're thinking of the questions, perhaps I can share my screen one last time, um, because I would like to ask Kwan Hong and Kimia about their special and favorite pieces from the exhibition. And they have told me to put these two images up. So I'd love to hear a little bit um, from them about why these are their favorites from the exhibition. Um, so I can start. Um, so for my piece, I, I love them all. I, they're like my children. I could not even pick. It was so hard to pick one. But I specifically picked this piece from Shaname. And the reason for that is that um, for to kind of first uh, a little introduction to Shaname. Shaname is a very well known storybook in my culture. It's written in poems and it's talking about all of these heroes and supernatural creatures, very similar to all the other culture that they have their own type of stories. And these stories follow a couple of main heroes during their life. And it's a very well known by Ferdosi. And um, it's a fantastic story. So by the time that I was growing up, I actually so clearly remember when my dad bought me this tiny version of Shaname. And that one, since it used to be like, it was a, like a children's book, it was actually written in a, like a sort of a story and not in poems to like make it easier to understand for kids. And so I grew up reading that and I loved them because like, it's, it's fun, of course, it's like heroes killing all of these dragons or whatnot. And um, by the time that I was putting this show together and I saw this piece, I was just, I love that so much because it's something that like I knew about before even wanted to like look into it or study it or anything. And also the illustration of it, the way that it's telling the story to kind of see this piece that I grew up with, but like this piece, this piece specifically that belongs to like hundreds of years ago to kind of like see that and be able to like really hold it. It was very just a fascinating experience for me and so that's the reason I really love this picture because like even though it's very old the color and the like the, it's still like it seems pretty decent for the age of it and so it was very just lovely for me to be able to like hold it and go through it and really be able to put it up to kind of like for others to also see it to kind of even if it's just a little description to get to know like the type of stories that we grew up um, in Iran with. So I just love this piece so much. It's one of my favorites too. <laughs> what about you, Kwan Hong? Why this piece? So. <laughs> Uh, the title, the title of the series is Modern Parodies of Genji. So I like this, this because so the designer is basically using a, a story to pair with a chapter in the tale of the Genji. So in this print, the I think it's chapter three and it's uh. Utsusemi, so Utsusemi is empty cicada, so it's an empty shell of the cicada. And in in the uh, in the tale of the Genji, Genji is trying to meet meet a female in the night, but the female no no is not proper, so she ran away, but she she left one of her clothes behind. 
So this is kind of like similar to the shell of the cicadas. And the story, the designer pair with the, Genji, the tail of Genji is Watanabe no Tsuna. So the story is about uh, the samurai. He, like he cut off a demon's arm so and the demon also ran away. So the cut off arm is also similar to the to the empty shell. So in this way, the designer try to link these two together by playing between the text and images. And and I think it's a very brilliant design because the the like the viewer of this print when they figure out they will think about it and maybe they because the there are four 54 chapter in the tale of the genji so they know th this is a series and they probably want to see other things and on the on the on the one hand it's interesting to like to decipher it but on the other hand it also shows the readers can prove that he has the knowledge and ability ability to decipher it so it is like a back and forth process. So the designer is clearly trying to communicate with the viewers. So, and as a person study art history, I think we are trying to interpret how the designer and the viewers are, are trying to interact with each other. So it's like, uh, we think of, we think what they do about it, and but we're also doing the same thing. So I think this is the an interesting example of like why I choose to study art history. Thank you, thank you. Indeed, like you know, it, it's really interesting. It, it um, the layered meanings behind these. Uh, the more you um, read into the text, the more you read into the image, you know, more layers are revealed to you. Um, and, and I think that this is indeed a wonderful piece. And I love the gory hand coming out of like, you know, the, the spirals as well, you know, it's, it's very evocative. Um, but thank you both for, for sharing um, your favorites from the collection. And thank you both for joining us today and for sharing your views and um, your comments about the exhibition. And most of all, like um, your inspirations and, and challenges and um, going through the process. It's been delightful to, to have you um, give us an, an overview um, and to give the audience an overview. And, and I, again, I wish that I'm gonna stop sharing now um, and move to gallery view where I can see all of you. But I this exhibition has currently been extended to June. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, we can all see this in person once the exhibition opens. I, I really encourage you to come because it's it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, um, and it's uh, it's just really wonderful to see these works up close and, and the, the, the images that I've just shown you do no justice at all <laughs> um, to the actual works. So, so please come when, when we are all able to, to come in person again. Thank you so much, Wai. Thank you, Kimian, Kwan. It was wonderful to hear you all. Thanks everyone for being here. Pleasure to gather virtually, safely and soundly have a restful weekend. Wishing you all well, thank you.